bring up about a ton of ice uh, once a month and it keeps uh, our frozen grandpa in a state that should be okay until he's ready to be fixed. This is Unplanned America, where you're invited to join Pav, Gonzo, and me, Nick, as we flee Australia to road trip around the land of the free in search of the weird, wonderful, mysterious, and sometimes scary unplanned side of America. In this episode, Gons and Pav spend some quality time without me as they go on a whirlwind road trip around the states, encountering a whole matter of unique characters and finding themselves in some quintessentially American scenes. So sit back, relax and enjoy as I ridicule these two idiots with a camera. The boys' brotherly trip started in the southern tip of Texas as they headed towards the coastline with plans of relaxing by the beach. It was March and spring had sprung. They really should have done some research. Is it videoing? Yep, the two clowns had stumbled across that US college rite of passage, spring break. Although I suspect Gon secretly knew it was on all along. Fart, fart, fart. Can't do it? Let me do it, let me do it, go. After the beach, you go to a room party before you go out. Okay. Oh, <laughs> oh say can you see? It's I like you because you're bald. Oh. oh. What'd she say? Ish. She said I'm bald. Oh. Oh. I like what, it. What, it's called evolution. <laughs> After a night of boozing, tasering and insults, Harv and Gons decided that spring break wasn't quite for them because they didn't get lucky and they headed west into the Texas wilderness. They were on their way to Marfa, a town famous for the unexplained phenomenon of their mysterious glowing lights in the desert night sky. So we've been rolling along the highway near the Mexican border in Texas and then we noticed there's this like old cemetery by the road and then uh... When we checked it out a little more, we realised there's like a whole abandoned, like ruined town just next to it, so it's kind of creepy. Wasn't that the word I was never meant to say? And I know so this swing set doesn't even look that old, but there's something about it that just makes it like uber creepy. Like adds a adds a creep factor. It squares the creep factor. Uh, so here I am with Tex, we're in Marfa, and I was just wondering if you could tell us what the Marfa lights are. That's why they're a mystery, nobody knows what they are. They appear a little bit on the horizon, but they'll move up and down and apart and split, and one will move up and down and they'll disappear, and one another one will appear. So there is no explanation. Hey, this is the uh, Marfa viewing station. We're going to try our luck and camp out here tonight and see if we can see the... Uh mysterious Marfa lights. It's from sundown to sun up. Right, so you've got to be committed to the cause to stick it out, out for the whole yeah, time. Yeah, you have to be dedicated. Nothing yet. I haven't even heard of this place before. I don't get it. Like, shouldn't it be more of a big deal? There's no lights, but there's no one around, and it's a bit scary, so... If you don't see me again, if you don't appear, I've been taken by the Marfa lights. We've moved to observation deck B, our shitty tent. Um, <clears throat> so we've called it a night on the lights, but I don't know if you can hear, but we're getting surrounded by a pack of wild coyotes. <laughs> so creepy. we may be joining the... Because rumour has it that the Marfa lights are in, like Indians that were slain and that they, they're dancing spirits, so... The next people that come out to see the Marfa lights might see our rotten carcasses dancing in the night sky <laughs> from the pack of wild coyotes. <coughs> Good night, Parvo. It may be your last. 
Thanks, Marfa Lights. Thanks for nothing, Marfa Lights. Maybe you'll see him. Maybe you'll have better luck than us. The Marfa camping episode would be the first of our many rough sleeping experiences. Such are the joys of travelling without a plan or a budget. On little sleep, the boys hopped in their car and headed further west, all the way to California, where they continued on their extraterrestrial quest. Uh, after the disappointment of seeing no lights in Marfa, we're having one last shot at this UFO thing. We're going to hang out with a guy called Larry, whose profession is hunting and tracking down UFOs. So he's going to put us up in his RV and we're going to see if we can't see some UFOs. All right, we're about to meet Larry and his wife. Larry's lifelong obsession with UFOs began as a child after his old man had a close encounter. One night when father was walking home from work, and when he got home that night, he was scared stiff. I mean, he was shaking. And he's telling his story. This thing just scared him, and, and what it was, he described it as a ring of fire. And whatever it was, it came down right just over his head. It was just suddenly there. My wife and I have spent the last eight years in a motorhome. And we did, we were in Yosemite eight years ago. So I look out the window in the motorhome across an 80 foot round clearing. There's nobody there but us. And there's lights in the trees, three parallel streaks. And they went out to the end of my peripheral vision and they're gone. By the time, by the time you get to 10, they already went past the sun. Just, whatever they were, they were going home because they were really moving. So this is the room where all the equipment resides. Come on in. This, this console here has uh, all the cameras, the cameras, the computers, the satellite receivers, and everything I need to watch the sky at night. The government instructed the people at Roswell to uh, change the story. They do that kind of thing all the time. They don't want to be embarrassed by their lack of knowledge. Larry Decker's sky surveillance setup was impressive and meant that even as he slept, any UFOs would be caught on camera. Wandering aimlessly without me, Gons and Parv were in California, in the home of self-appointed UFO chaser Larry Decker, in the hope of encountering alien activity. Uh, this is where we're going to be staying tonight in Larry's RV. He's been kind enough to offer us a place to stay the night. Let's check out the digs. Here's my little bed here. It was a table. And if we go through here, Gonzo's got the master bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> That's an alien life form. Larry spent a number of years in the US Navy building guided missiles. Armed with these skills, he's created his own UFO tracking station. UFO chasers. Yeah. Yay! Yes. Yay! 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 Hooray! <laughs> Parv, Gons, Larry and Kuka turned in for the night as the cameras kept watch on the night sky. When they rose the next morning, they checked to see if first contact had been made. All right, so Larry's been reviewing the footage from last night, and what's the verdict? Uh, I, I don't see any UFOs from last night. Damn it. Tonight, we'll go at it again. Damn you, extraterrestrials. <laughs> Pablo, you're doing such a great job in chasing UFOs. You deserve to be inducted into the official UFO chaser oh, man. world. So we would like to present you with a hat. Proudest day of my life. And a shirt. Now you are one of the people in black. Oh, thank you very much. Congratulations. Enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> you are now an official UFO chaser. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Can we do the alien? Can we do the... Oh, yeah. 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 The boys' time with Larry and Kuka was the first of many such instances where we were humbled by the hospitality of complete strangers from all across America who welcomed us into their homes with open arms. After a good night's sleep in Larry's RV, the boys then made the short drive to the place our queen, Celine Dion, calls home. 
we're in Las Vegas, it's the 15th annual Rockabilly Festival, so we're going to go get amongst it. Obviously people come to Vegas to get uh, drunk and go to clubs, but we decided to get our Rockabilly on, so let's have fun. Rockabilly culture traces all the way back to the original bad boy rock and rollers of the 1950s. It's gone through a couple of revivals since Elvis first hit the stage in Vegas, and its heavily tattered current incarnation is cooler than ever. Rockabilly. That's, it's tough to explain to a normal person. It's just rock and roll with a little mix of cars, and styles, and You feel like you're, you matter here, like everyone is just beautiful. Yeah, and unique, like you can just dress however you want, but like it's just, it's so, no matter how you look, and you just feel beautiful, and everyone here makes you feel beautiful. So to me, Rockabilly is just about the naughty old school, it's old school feel with a kind of dirty feel to it. Dude, your hair is amazing, and I want to know how you do that. Thank you. Um, actually, all I use is hairspray. It takes me about five minutes to do it. I've been doing it for 10 years now. Can I touch it? <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> oh, the rockabilly scene? Oh, uh, man, it's it's like wild, man. You can look around, you see, uh, you know, all walks of life in this uh, game here. I've been in this for a long time. You know, I, I branched off from low riding, which I still do. But uh, you got to expand your mind and, you know, tap into all the fun resources. The iPod dot kind of ruins the estate. <laughs> I'm about to hit a burlesque show and to see who will be this year's Miss Viva Las Vegas. The old school exotic striptease art form of burlesque has also gone through a revival of late. And here in Sin City, it's joined with the rockabilly scene to form a sexy, badass hybrid stunt. <laughs> Once I arrived, there'd be no chance I'd let them ruin our perfectly good car. Tweedledum and Tweedledee decided to get arty. If you can call what you're about to see art. Uh, so we've been rolling around in our 1998 Toyota Camry. Uh, it's pretty plain looking, as you can see. So we've decided to uh, get our friends that live in LA, all about three of them that we know, to come down and help us paint it. About one of us has artistic skill, the rest of us no don't know anything. So uh, let's turn this piece of shit into a piece of art. Uh, working on a map of the U.S. We'll see how it turns out. <laughs> Alright, Gons, what are you doing? So there's two things. First year on the bonnet is my sort of interpretation of the greatest movie ever, <laughs> poster of The Lost Boys. <laughs> uh, and it's also to sort of pay respect to Corey Haim, who we lost uh, a couple of years ago. So it's one of his finest roles. It's my name, because I like to piss all over everything I touch. Like, this car is going to see some good time, so we've got Awesome Patrol for Go America. America. I tried to draw something, but then I remembered that I'm shit at art. So I've just gone and done stencils of yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm going to do some flames over here and here. <laughs> What do you think, Carver? Yeah, it's looking awesome. I thought it was going to look way lamer, but yeah. it's fucking awesome. Some of our friends have artistic skill, and we actually have some friends, which yeah. is a surprise. By the end of our trip together, we had replaced the ignition chamber, timing belt, three tyres, and the entire engine. I miss that clown car piece of shit. Gons and Parv had a month of freedom to road trip around the States before I arrived to whip them into shape. And it's safe to say that without me, they may not have survived the trip, as this next low light shows. We're in the middle of nowhere, set up camp, We've got our little tyre barbecue here, cooking up food, and soon it's time for some fireworks. <laughs> Run! <laughs> Fuck. 
it's all gone now. Cleared up our mess. Holy shit. Some <coughs> might say we're heroes. Inhaling a copious amount of smoke wasn't the only time our bodies copped a beating in the States. From Gonza's run-in with poison ivy, to my failed acrobatics, and most significantly, Parv's stint in hospital in Portland, where his appendix burst. That last firework fucking landed over here inside of the fucking fire. After their bungled fireworks display, the boys then headed through some picturesque countryside on their way to Colorado. So, town folk in Boulder told us about some dead dude that's been cryogenically frozen in a town called Netherlands, so we're going to go check it out. We're meeting up with the head cryogenicist, uh, and apparently they're replacing the ice on this dead dude who froze himself in like the 80s or something. Some Norwegian, some Norwegian cracker. Girl, I'm okay. Here we sit at the uh, dry ice facility where we come once a month to pick up uh, about a ton of dry ice. We've got our two containers on the back of the truck. Uh, we've got our personnel to help load and unload. We usually take two of us and a truck capable of carrying a ton of ice once a month. And this is our job. We've been doing it for 18 years. I can't wait longer. I can't wait. I can't wait. fucking car just exploded so now we're riding in the back of the truck with them I don't know what we're gonna do about the car will I, will I dance with you will I dance with you for the night is through smile boy the frozen dead guy otherwise known as Brito Morristel aka grandpa he died in Norway about 25 years ago, and they had him shipped in, uh, to the west coast of America, to Los Angeles, at one of the cryonic facilities where they preserved him and did all everything necessary to him and got him ready. And they kept him there for a year or two. Then his son Trigby came here, bought this piece of property, started to build all this stuff on it, and then moved his father from Los Angeles into the shed. And Trigby was deported, he had his friends doing the ice for about six months, and then uh, they got tired of doing it and he lucked into me. And I've been taking care of him ever since. Uh, we bring up about a ton of ice uh, once a month, and it maintains our cryonic temperatures at about a minus 109 Fahrenheit. And it keeps uh, our frozen grandpa in a state that should be okay until he's ready to be fixed. Ready? I think so. <laughs> so this is Grandpa's sarcophagus. Well, actually, this is his, this is his cryonic chamber. His sarcophagus is inside yet. Um, there's a picture of the gentleman up there. What he used to look like when he was alive. You know, we try to keep some comedy things here and there about cryonics. Uh, this is his supply cabinet. Um, he likes to invite people in for drinks and stuff like that. Yeah. There he is. And this is his case. They believe the soul is intimately tied up with the physical body. When the physical body dies and deteriorates, the soul goes away. If you put the physical body back together again, the soul will come back into it. Temperature at minus 70, something like that. That's always good. Um, we got our ice cream and cake here for when we have parties. This is his, this is his millennium birthday cake we got for him back in 2000. You see, it's still got, still got burrito on it. We saved the last piece of his cake with his name on it. We don't have to be philosophically aligned with the client to be able to perform. And he believes that, and I don't know, it might, maybe he's right. I don't know, I really don't think so, but maybe he's right. And meanwhile, we maintain this. We make a, you know, a couple of bucks at doing it. That He's got the money to do this because it's his belief, his philosophy. So who are we to argue? That's why he's in America. America is the land of free.
Appropriate place for it. Ah. Yeah. As low as possible. All the ice as low as possible. Put on our little uh, our little uh, air control device. Oh, I get one too. Sure. Like the way you walk. Like the way you talk. Like the way you move. Oh. Ice cold or something, you don't even feel it. Oh. Would you ever consider being cryogenically frozen? No. Why? Well, Waste of time and money. <laughs> <laughs> Gonzo and Pav's carefree road tripping finally came to an end as I came along to ruin the party. After working myself and the boys hard for the next five months, I too got time to soak up some of the American fun back where it all began in Texas. Trees! It's September 1st in Austin and that means one thing, it's the start of the college football season but it's not really about the football, more so it's about the tailgating. Tailgating refers to the gathering of sports fans in a car park, drinking and partying around the open tailgates of their vehicles before a big game. It used to be a pretty underground practice which evolved due to a lack of bars near Florida State University in the 60s, but it's now a huge event in and of itself. Each year, Americans spend a whopping 35 billion bucks on booze and food for tailgate parties, and many of them don't even go to the game. Okay, I'm here with Jack. He knows a little bit about tailgating culture. Uh, tell us about it, man. Right, so when you're when you're tailgating in a Texas football game, what you want to do is you want to drink as much as you can. Also, if you want to hang out with people, it's just a social event. One of the biggest ones every week. It's good stuff. You got to come out to tailgates. So we get a good eight hours of tailgating in. The game's great too, but. Uh, yeah, tailgating is where it's at. It's just a, it's just a culture, it's just a way of life down here. Time. Oh, that's a game over right there. That's game over. The breakdown, I'm out of control, but I won't break down my eyes on the road. Nobody's safe now. Ain't planning to slow. I think they afraid out. I'm ready to go. Tell them we go. Yeah, tell them we go. And I'm shining like a I'm Glenn America started six months ago in South Padre Island, Texas with spring break. We're ending the story where it began in Texas. We'd been to more than 35 states and driven more than 35,000 kilometers, but we'd only scratched the surface of a nation that's as diverse culturally as it is geographically. We were excited to be heading home, but unplans were already being put in place to get back on the road again. 